What's up guys, it's Brian again from Lake Hickory Scuba and Marina. If you are new to our channel, do me a huge favor, hit this little subscribe button right here and ding that little bell as well. That way you guys are going to be notified every time we upload new content. Now we are on chapter three in our series of the SSI Open Water Scuba Diver Program. And before we continue, I want to make a quick disclaimer. Please do not use this video nor any of our videos here in this series to actually learn how to scuba dive. You need to be seeking out your local SSI Open Water Scuba Instructor to teach you the proper ways to scuba dive. What we would, though, like for you to do is use these videos as a study guide to help you prepare yourself for the open water final exam. So with that being said, let's jump into Chapter 3. So the first thing that you're going to come across in Chapter 3 of your SSI open water program, of course, is breathing. How does the breathing process actually work? And I'm going to try to break it down as easily as I can and show you the structures of the lungs. So you have two different lungs here and you've got these little branches that come through. These are called the bronchioles. At the end of each bronchiole, we're going to have these little great black air sacs that we call alveolis. And inside these alveolis, this is where we have what's called gas exchange. So basically when you breathe in, you're breathing in a mixture of two different gases, oxygen and nitrogen. They're going to go through the lung structure. It's going to come down into the alveolis and those two gases are going to separate. Nitrogen in itself is an inert gas. That simply means it's not good for you, but at the same time, it's not bad for you. It just kind of hangs out there. Oxygen, though, is a gas that we can actually metabolize and use as a food source. So the oxygen is going to separate from the nitrogen. It's going to go all throughout your body, fueling your body. Now, it does become a byproduct called CO2 after it's been used up, and it's going to come back into the lungs, mix back with the nitrogen, and then we simply begin the exhalation process. Now, this gas exchanger, this perfusion of oxygen, is almost instantaneous. So before you even finish the inhaling process, it's already happened. That way, when you begin to exhale, you're getting rid of all that bad expired gas. This is another good reason that we should always breathe while diving, because we never want to hold in any CO2 while we're underwater. We're also going to see how holding your breath can actually be dangerous, if not deadly to us, during the ascent phase later on in this chapter. Now, if we remember the second rule in diving from chapter two, that we should always come up slowly, there's a Good reason here. Anytime that we're underwater, we're actually going to be absorbing a certain amount of gases in our body and primarily nitrogen here. And that nitrogen can get trapped all in our body. It can get trapped in our lungs and any really any tissue of our body. And we also talked about the first rule of never holding your breath. Well, you will notice if we remember Boyle's Law, pressure and volume. As we ascend, that pressure is going to be decreasing. That means any gas volume is going to be expanding out. That can be the gas that's in your lungs if you're holding your breath. That can be the gas that, say, your body absorbed, which we'll fix to learn about through Henry's Law. And it can also be the gases in our equipment, the gases in our mask, the gases that's in our dry suits, things like that. So during the ascent phase, as pressure decreases, air volume is going to be expanding expanding out. It's okay for some of that to expand outward. It's actually okay for all of it to expand outward, but it has to be done at a certain rate. And scuba divers, we have ascent rates that we do not exceed. That ascent rate is basically 30 feet a minute. Or if you want to break it down the way I do, that is a foot every two seconds. Now, a lot of times with dive computers, they're actually going to let us know how fast we are coming up. If we come up faster than, say, that 30 feet a minute or a foot every two seconds, those dive computers are going to beep at us religiously to make us slow down so that we don't run the risk of any type of barotrauma or air embolism or spontaneous pneumothorax or mediastinal emphysema or even subcutaneous emphysema. We want to prevent all these overexpansion injuries by simply coming up slow and breathing in and out just like we're doing right now. Now, earlier I stated that nitrogen in itself was an inert gas. That simply means it's not good for you, but at the same time, it's not bad for you. It just simply means we don't use it for any real purpose. However, with it being an inert gas, since we do not metabolize it, as we descend down into the water column and stay for a lengthy period of time, our body's actually going to start absorbing that nitrogen. Now, I want you to picture yourself laying out on a nice sunny beach area and you're laying under the sun and you get a nice pretty tan. But what happens if you stay too long? Your body overabsorbs too much ultraviolet light and now you don't have a pretty tan, you are sunburnt. 
Well, the same thing can happen underwater. If we stay for too long, our body is going to overabsorb way too much nitrogen. Now, we can determine how much nitrogen we are absorbing by several different things. One, of course, the dive tables. We'll learn later on how the dive tables actually calculate how much nitrogen our body absorbs based off depth and time. The other way, of course, is dive computers. Now, the benefit of dive computers over the tables, dive computers are going to constantly recalculate. So as we make our ascent and we come up into lower partial pressures, it's also going to tell us how much nitrogen we're bleeding off per foot, if you will, versus just bleeding off at the surface. But we should always be cautious of how much nitrogen we're taking on, and we should always stay well within our no decompression limits. Of course, that is if you don't have the proper training, say for technical diving or even decompression diving. Now, one of the questions I get a lot is, what about flying after diving? I'm going on this nice tropical destination somewhere, and I've, I want to dive all week, and then I've got a flight at the end of the week. Well, the scuba industry, of course, tells us that we need about 24 hours of time elapsed between our last dive and actually getting on an airplane. And that's simply because we need 24 hours for our body to completely bleed off every bit of nitrogen that we took on. Now, typically, 12 hours is going to be long enough at sea level to to bleed off that nitrogen, but as you ascend up into altitude in an airplane, the pressure is going to drop drastically. And that's also mean that any residual nitrogen that you have just from normal breathing gas is also going to expand pretty rapidly as well. And one thing that we can't really do is control how fast that plane comes up. We can control how fast we swim up, but yet we can't control how fast that plane goes up. So we always want to allow ourselves 24 hours of time before we fly. Now there's a couple things that I want to talk about that. One, your dive computer is actually going to tell you when that no fly time has lapsed and then you're going to be safe to dive. The other question I get a lot about flying though is, well, let's say that we're out on a dive boat and we do get decompression sickness and we have to be flown by or flown out, say by the US Coast Guard. How does that work? How can they fly but yet we can't get into an airplane? Well, there's a soft ceiling anywhere, say between 8,000 and 10,000 feet that we can safely get up to altitude without the pressure drop being so dramatic. One thing that we got to remember is the pressure of air versus the pressure of water is two completely different things. They're two different medians and air does not weigh as much as what water does. So as we're ascending, the pressure differential is not going to be quite as great as what the pressure differential as water is during the ascent. But even at lower altitudes, we still need to restrain from flying the best that we can. Now, a lot of times helicopters can fly at very low levels. However, an airplane can't necessarily do that. Now the next thing that we need to understand about nitrogen, even though it's an inert gas and we don't use it, the only thing we really do as scuba divers is we simply absorb it. Nitrogen in itself can become narcotic at higher partial pressures, and basically the deeper we go, the greater the effect that partial pressure of nitrogen is going to have on us. It's kind of like being drunk. You make a lot of dumb decisions. Now imagine being around 100 feet and getting drunk off nitrogen. You may make that wrong decision to pull out your rig. You may make the wrong decision to continue on going deeper and deeper to where the partial pressure is going to be even greater, and the effect is just going to constantly increase. This is why it's very important that we limit our ourselves to our depth. Now at the open water level, you are certified to 130 feet. However, the industry recommends you not going deeper than say 60 feet without further training. That further training could be the SSI deep diver course. The great thing about that deep diver course is it's going to teach you how to work your gas management. It's also going to teach you how to plan proper dives to that depth. And it's also going to be under the direct tutelage of your SSI deep diving instructor who can be there and assist you in the event you do develop nitrogen narcosis. Now, if you want another great class that, of course, is going to expand your knowledge of how to handle situations like that, look at the SSI React Right course and the SSI Rescue Diver course because it's really going to break down how do you handle another diver who, say, has been narked underwater, or how do you handle a diver who is unconscious underwater, or how do you handle that diver at the surface if they do develop decompression sickness. Now, oxygen toxicity is going to be the next little thing that you read about in Chapter 3, and though this does not really affect the standard diver who's breathing 21% at normal recreational depths, it does and can affect divers who are breathing mixed gases, such as, say, nitrox. All nitrox is is just a higher partial pressure of O2 within the mixture of gas you're breathing. And oxygen toxicity can affect your central nervous system. It can literally shut you down underwater. And we always should be vigilant of the partial pressure of O2 we're actually taking on. If you 
you want to learn a little bit more about oxygen partial pressures, look at the SSI nitrox course, and I think it'll really help you out. You'll see how nitrox is going to extend your no decompression limits, which could theoretically give you more time underwater, but can also shorten up your surface intervals as well, which will allow you to jump back into water in between dives a lot sooner. So the last two maladies that we're really going to focus on in this chapter is carbon dioxide buildup and carbon monoxide poisoning. Now we've already talked a little bit about carbon dioxide buildup. This is simply caused by either skip breathing or holding our breath underwater. We have to remember that gas exchange is instant. Before you even finish inhaling to start the exhalation process, you've already expired the oxygen you took in and it's converted to CO2. And we don't want to hold that in. CO2 is that gas that forces us to breathe again. And if we hold in too much CO2, one of two things can happen. One, we can develop what's called labored breathing, which is not going to make that cylinder last very long. And number two, of course, you could theoretically fall asleep underwater. Now, it's rare when that happens because every diver breathes normal. We simply inhale and exhale. Now, carbon monoxide poison, this is caused by bad gas. And a lot of times back in the old days, we had basically what was called diesel compressors. So basically, the compressor would be sucking gas into the intake. It would be pushing out diesel fumes, which would also go into the intake and we would get bad gas in our cylinders. And this is why it's so important that we test our gas before we ever jump in. We can do a smell test, we can do a taste test, and if it smells or tastes bad, we simply don't use that. But did you know that you could also get carbon monoxide poison simply by being on the dive boat? This is why we recommend divers to always sit towards the bow or the front of the boat or midship of the boat while traveling out to the dive destination. You never want to sit back where the engine is. You're constantly going to be inhaling the fumes off that engine, and as you descend, the partial pressure of those fumes are going to increase. That simply means the effect of that gas is going to increase as well, and you can develop carbon monoxide poisoning. But guys, that's going to do it for chapter three. I really hope that you found this chapter very informative to you. I hope you found it educational. And I really do hope that it helps you pass your open water final exam. That is the sole purpose of this video series is to help you guys prepare for your SSI final open water exam. And once again, please do not use these videos to learn how to dive. Just simply use them as a study guide for your exam. But guys, if you got any questions on chapter three, drop me a comment down below and I'll try to answer it the best I can as quickly as I can as well. I'm going to go ahead and sign off today. Take care. God bless, and I'll see you in the next video.